Hello, good morning. This is Elevens is with Fran, and this morning I'm going to read you a sweet, zippy short story called A View of Exmoor by Sylvia Townsend Warner, written in 1948. Um, you know how this works by now. You get a cup of tea and a piece of cake or something. The cake isn't compulsory. And I read you a short story and try and distract us all from the craziness out there. What do you think? Um, lovely to have so many regulars now. Uh, yeah, this is a short zippy story, slightly strange, kind of fun. Let me know what you think. And then I'm thinking next week I might do a whole Dorothy Whipple week and then the week after a whole Molly Panter Downs week. What do you think? Let me know. All requests taken, like a literary jukebox. <laughs> um, okay, you've had time to settle down. Here we go. A View of Exmoor by Sylvia Townsend Warner. From Bath where Mr Finch was taking the waters, the Finches travelled by car into Devon to attend the wedding of Mrs Finch's niece, Arminella Blount. <laughs> I mean, of course she's called Arminella Blount, aren't we all? What a name. This was in 1936, when weddings could be garish. The Finches made a very creditable family contribution. Mrs Finch in green, green moiré, Cordelia and Clara in their bridesmaids' dresses, copied from the Gainsborough portrait of an earlier Arminella Blount in the character of Flora. <laughs> Mr Finch in, as his wife said, his black and grey. Arden Finch in an Eton suit, would have looked like any normal 12-year-old boy in an Eton suit if measles, measles had not left him preternaturally thin, pale and owl-eyed. All these fine feathers, plus two top hats, an Indian shawl to wrap around Arden in case it turned cold, and a picnic basket in case anyone felt hungry, made the car seem unusually full during the drive to Devon. On the return journey, it was even fuller, because the finches were bringing back Arminella's piping bullfinch and the music box that was needed to continue its education, as well as the bridesmaids' bouquets. It was borne in on Mr Finch that other travellers along the main road were noticing his car and its contents more than they needed to. And this impression was confirmed when the passengers in two successive sharabanks cheered and waved. Mr Finch, the soul of consideration, turned into a side road to spare his wife and daughters the, the embarrassment of these public acclamations. Pember and South Pigworthy, Mrs Finch read aloud from a signpost. The doctor who took out my tonsils was called Pemba. It's so nice to find a name one knows. Mr Finch replied that he was going to take an alternative way home. After a while, he stopped and looked for his road map, but he couldn't find it. He drove on. Hmm. Father, said Cordelia a little later, we've been through this village before. Don't you think we'd better ask? Is that all it is, said Mrs Finch. What a relief. I thought I was having one of those mysterious delusions when one half of my brain mislays the other half. <laughs> Mr Finch continued to drive on. Arden, who had discovered that the bars of the birdcage gave out notes of varying pitch when he plucked them, was carrying out a systematic test with a view to being able to play rule Britannia. Cordelia and Clara and their mother discussed the wedding. Suddenly, Mrs Finch exclaimed, Oh, Henry, stop, stop! There's such a beautiful view of Exmoor. Ten-foot hedges rose on either side of the lane they were in. The lane went steeply uphill, and Mr Finch had hoped that he had put any views of Exmoor safely behind him. But with unusual mildness, he stopped and backed the car till it was even with the gate. Beyond the gate was a falling meadow, a pillowy middle distance of woodland, and beyond that, pure and cold and unimpassioned, the silhouette of the moor. Why not, Mr Finch said, taking the good the gods provided, why not stop and picnic? It occurred to him that once the car was emptied, the road map might come to light. The Finches sat down in the meadow and ate cucumber sandwiches. Oh, yum. Arden wore the Indian shawl. The bullfinch in its cage was brought out of the car to have a little fresh air. And gazing at the view, Mrs Finch said that looking at Exmoor always reminded her of her Aunt Harriet's inexplicable boots. <laughs> what boots, mother? Cordelia asked. She saw them on Exmoor, Mrs Finch said. She and Uncle Lionel both saw them. They were children at the time. They were picking whortleberries, such a disappointing fruit. All those folk art fruits are much overrated and nobody's ever been able to account for them. Oh, and nobody's ever been able to account for them, the boots. But why should they have to be accounted for, all Clara asked. Were they sticking out of a bog? 
they were in a cab. Your Aunt Harriet, Mr Finch began. For some reason, it angered him to hear of Boots being in a cab while he was still in no doubt as to whether, as, uh, while he was still in doubt as to whether the map was in the car. Of course, Mrs Finch went on, in those days, cabs were everywhere, but not on Exmoor, where, where there were no roads. It was a perfectly ordinary cab, one of the kind that open in hot weather. The driver was on the box and the horse was waving its tail to keep the flies off. They looked as if they'd been there quite a long time. Days and days, Arden asked. Oh, I'm afraid not, dear. Decomposition ha had not set in. But as if they'd been there long enough to get resigned to it. An hour or so. But how could Aunt Harriet tell how long? In those days, children were very different. Nice and inhibited, Mrs Finch said. So Aunt Harriet and Uncle Lionel observed the cab from a distance and walked on. Presently, they saw two figures, a man and a woman. The man was very pale and sulky, and the woman was crying her eyes out. But the most remarkable thing of all, even more remarkable than the cab, was that the woman wasn't wearing a hat. In those days, no self-respecting woman could stir without a hat. And on the ground was a pair of boots. While Harriet and Lionel were trying to get a little nearer without seeming inquisitive, the woman snatched up the boots and ran back to the cab. She ran right past the children. She was crying so bitterly she didn't even notice them. She jumped into the cab, threw the boots onto the opposite seat. The driver whipped up his horse and the cab went bumping and jolting away from over them all. And as for the man, he walked off looking like murder. So what do you make of that? Well... I suppose they'd been wading and then they quarrelled and she drove away with his boots as a revenge, said Clara. He was wearing boots, said Mrs Finch. Well, perhaps they were eloping, Clara said, and the boots were part of their luggage that he'd forgotten to pack, like father, and she changed her mind in time. Speed is essential to an elopement and so is secrecy. To drive over Exmoor in an open cab would be quite inconsistent with either, said Mr Finch. Hmm... Perhaps the cab lost its way in a more mist, con contributed Arden. Hey, listen, I can do almost all the first line of Royal Britannia now. But Clara, why need it, need it be an elopement, Cordelia asked. Perhaps she was just a devoted wife who found a note from her husband saying he had lost his memory or committed a crime or, or something and was going out of her life. And she seized up a spare pair of boots, leapt hatless into a cab and tracked him across Exmoor to make sure he had a dry pair to change into. And when Harriet and Lionel saw them, he just turned on her with a brutal oath. If he had been such a devoted wife, she wouldn't have taken the boots away again, Clara said. Yes, she would. It was the breaking point, Cordelia said. Actually, though, I don't believe she was married to him at all. I think it was an assignation and she'd taken her husband's boots with her as a blind. <laughs> then why did she take them out of the cab, inquired Clara. And why didn't she wear a hat like Mother said? No, Cordelia, I think your theory is artistically all right. It looks the boots straight in the face, but I've got a better one. I think they spent a guilty night together and, being a forgetful man, he put his boots out to be cleaned and then in the morning she was hopelessly compromised, so she snatched up the boots and drove after him to give a, him a piece of her mind. Yes, but he was wearing boots already, Cordelia said. Well, he would have had several pairs. At that date, a libertine would have had hundreds of boots, wouldn't he, mother? He might not have taken them with him wherever he went, dear, said Mrs Finch. Mr Finch said, you have both rushed off on an assumption. Because the lady drove away in the cab, you both assume that she arrived in it. Women always jump to conclusions. Why shouldn't the cab have brought the man? If she was hatless, she might have been an escaped lunatic and the man a keeper from the asylum who came in search of her. Well, why did he bring a pair of boots, Cordelia asked. Ladies' boots, said Mr Finch firmly. He can't have been much of a lunatic keeper if he let her get away with his cab, Clara said. I didn't say he was a lunatic keeper, Clara, said Mr Finch. I was merely trying to point out to you and your sister that in cases like this one must examine the evidence from all sides. Perhaps, said Arden. The cab driver was a lunatic and perhaps that's why he drove them onto Exmoor and perhaps they were his boots and the man and the woman were arguing as to which of them was to pay his fare. Perhaps, interrupted by his father and both his sisters all speaking at once, Arden then returned to his rendering of Rural Britannia. Mrs Finch removed some crumbs and a few caterpillars from her lap and looked at the view of Exmoor. Suddenly, 
A passage on the birdcage was broken by a light twang, a flutter of wings, a cry from Arden. The cage door had flipped open and the bullfinch had, had flown out. Everybody said, oh, and grabbed at it. The bullfinch flew to the gate, balanced there, flirted its tail and flew on into the lane. It flew in a surprised, incompetent way, making short flights, hurling itself from side to side of the lane. But though Cordelia and Clara leapt after it, trying to catch it in their broad-brimmed hats, and although Arden only just missed it by overbalancing on a bough, thereby falling out of the tree and making his nose bleed, and though Mr Finch walked after it, holding up the birdcage and crying, Sweet! 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 in a falsetto voice that trembled with feeling, the bullfinch remained at liberty, and with a little practice flew better and better. Stop, all of you, said Mrs Finch who had been attending to Arden, wiping her blood-stained hands on the grass. You'll frighten it. Henry, do leave off saying sweet, you'll only strain yourself. What we need is the music box. If it hears the music box, it will be reminded of its home. And remember, it's a tame bullfinch. Arden, dear, please keep your shawl on and look for some ground cell if you aren't too weak from loss of blood. The music box weighed about 50 pounds. It was contained in an ebony case and at every movement it, it emitted reproachful chords. On one side, it had a handle. On the other side, the handle had fallen off, and by the time the finches had got the box out of the car, they were flushed and breathless. His groans mingle, mingling with the reproachful chords, Mr Finch staggered up the lane in pursuit of the bullfinch with the music box in his arms. Mrs Finch walked beside him, tenderly entreating him to be careful, for if anything happened to it, it would break Arminella's heart. Blithesome and cumberless, like the bird of the wilderness, the bullfinch flitted on ahead. I am not carrying this thing a step further, said Mr Finch, setting down the music box at the side of the lane. Since you insist, Eleanor, I will sit here and play it. The rest of you can walk on and turn the bird somehow and drive it back till the music reminds it of home. Clara said, I expect we shall go on for miles. Seeing his family vanish around a bend in the lane, Mr Finch found himself nursing a hope that Clara's expectation might be granted. He was devoted to music boxes. He sat down beside it and read the list of its repertory, which was written in a copper plate hand inside the lid. The harp that once, that once through Tara's halls, the prayer from Moisey, the Copenhagen waltz. A very pleasant choice for an interval of repose, well-earned repose in this leafy seclusion. Mr Finch ran his finger over the prickled cylinder blew away a little dust, then wound the box up. Unfortunately, there were a great many midges, the inherent pest of leafy seclusions. He paused to light a cigar. Then he set off the music box. It chirruped through three and a half tunes and stopped, as music boxes do. Behind him, a voice said somewhat diffidently, I say, can I be of any help? Glancing from the corner of his eye, Mr Finch saw a young man whose bare, ruined legs and rucksack suggested he was on a walking tour. No, thank you, Mr Finch said. Dismissingly, he re ran the music box and set it going again. Around the bend of the lane came two replicas in rather bad condition of Gainsborough's well-known portrait of Arminella Blount in the character of Flora. A cadaverous small boy draped in a blood-stained Indian shawl and a middle-aged lady dressed in the height of fashion who carried a birdcage. <laughs> Once again, Mr Finch was forced to admit the fact that the instant his family escaped from his supervision, they somehow managed to make themselves conspicuous. Tripping nervously to the strains of the Copenhagen waltz, the young man on a walking tour skirted around them and hurried on. We've got it, cried Mrs Finch, brandishing the birdcage. Why the deuce couldn't you explain that to the young man, asked Mr Finch. Eleanor, why couldn't you explain? But why should I? Mrs Finch asked. He looks so hot and careworn, and I expect he only gets a fortnight's holiday all the year through. Why should I spoil it for him? Why shouldn't he have something to look, why shouldn't he have something to look back on in his old age? It's such an interesting story. So funny and interesting and sort of strange about the power of narrative and memory and also kind of like ridiculous with the bullfinch and Aramint, Aramilla Blantz and the music box. Um, and really about storytelling, I think. I don't know, what do you think that, st that story is really about? Um, 
let me know in the comments below. Thank you so much for joining Elevens is with Fran today. Thursday. It's Thursday, right? We'll do another one tomorrow. And then um, maybe next week, yeah, do a whole series. Dorothy Whipple, Monty Pantata Molly Pantadowns. What do you think? All right. Lovely having you. Hope you enjoyed your cup of tea. And Elevens is generally. And I will see you soon.